My people know not the judgment of the Lord. Go to Jeremiah, please, the 8th chapter. 8th chapter of Jeremiah. I want you to read with me just one verse and then leave Jeremiah 8th chapter open on your lap because that's where we're going to be the rest of the message. The 7th verse, chapter 8, Jeremiah. The stork in the heaven knoweth her appointed times, and the turtle and the crane and the swallow observe the time of their coming. But my people know not the judgment of the Lord. What an indictment. Let's pray. Lord, you are doing something very deep in this church. You're doing something very profound and wonderful. You're digging deep into our hearts. And in 1997, Lord, you're going to purge us as we've never been purged. You're going to search us like we've never been searched. You're going to bring forth revelation and truth that sets us free. And Lord, out of that is going to come a rejoicing such as never been heard before in this house. Times Square Church is going to be jumping with the praises of God. Oh, Lord, you're going to do something marvelous in our midst because you've begun it in our hearts. You've begun it here. You've begun it in all of our hearts. Those of us who deliver the word of the Lord, you've done a work, oh, God, this past year and now you're preparing us. I share what Pastor Carter said, a great anticipation of what you're going to do. But, Lord, first you have to cut. The surgeon comes in and he cuts so there can be healing. Lord, you may have to cut even deeper this afternoon as you did this morning. But, Lord, we thank you for the surgeon's knife. We thank you, Lord, that you're willing. What a, what a marvelous act of grace to deal with us as you do firmly, lovingly, but, oh, God, without compromise. Lord Jesus, I want to hear when I come to this church, I want to hear an uncompromising message. I want that which would would expose anything hidden in my life. I want the mirror held in front of my face. Oh, Spirit of God, come down now. I take your authority, Father, over every principality and power of darkness. Nothing, nothing, nothing shall hinder the word of the Lord. Lord, sanctify our ears. Sanctify my voice and let every ear hear the word of the living God. We glorify you. And we chase every demon out of this house. Every devil out of hell must go in Jesus' name. That the word of the Lord have free course. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. In the first eight chapters of Jeremiah, the Lord uh, poses some incredible questions, powerful questions. And he's listing, God is listing his concerns for his own people. He's not talking about the heathen. He's not talking about the enemies of Israel. He's talking about God's own chosen people. And, and some of the questions God asked of Jeremiah, like this, he said, why is there such a tendency to backsliding among my people? He says, why do they cling so stubbornly to their secret sins? Why do they continue in their deception? And why do they have a tendency to go back to their old sins? And then he goes on in the first eight chapters, why are my people not really repenting of their sins? Because there was a false repentance. He said, why do they not blush when they sin so openly? He said, my people don't know how to blush anymore. He said, why don't they even say, what have we done? He said, they sin and they don't even ask the question, what have we done? There's no regret. They sin without remorse. They sin without guilt. Why are my people not letting go of their sins? Why are they not wanting full deliverance from the bondage of the sin? He said, why aren't they coming to me for freedom? Why are they not blessing for their sins? Now, folks, he's talking about, God is talking about his own dear, beloved children. He's not talking about heathen. Now, think about that as we go on in the message today. You'll find these God-spoken questions, especially in the 8th chapter of Jeremiah. Because you see, in Jeremiah's time, the people were coming to the Lord weeping. They came searching the Scriptures. They, they, they were probing into the Word of God. But even though they studied the law and claimed they wanted to walk by the law, 
They refused to forsake their idolatry. They wanted their idols. They wanted the sins of their flesh. And they wanted to serve God at the same time. It was a mixture of worship of idols and a worship of Jehovah. And that sickened the heart of God. God says in the, look at verse 5, chapter 8, verse 5. Why then is this people of Jerusalem? You know, Jerusalem is his own beloved city. And these are his own beloved people. When then is this people of Jerusalem, why then is this people of Jerusalem slidden back by perpetual backsliding? They hold fast the seat. They refuse to return. He says, why are they holding on to their sins? Folks, look at me, please. This is the question I believe God is asking this church and every church in these last days. If we really believe Jesus is coming, then we stop playing games. If we believe that Jesus is coming and he's right at the door and we're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ, then we go into this word and we tremble at what we read and we do everything within our God-given powers and under the conviction, the anointing of the Holy Spirit to deal with our lives. And again, I hear the Holy Spirit saying in our day to me, to you, to all of us, why do you still hold on to the deceit that's in your heart? Why don't you return to me and why don't you let it go? Why aren't you coming to, for full deliverance? Why this double standard, this mixture in your heart that you would come and serve me and worship me and praise me and love me and go into my word, inquiring of my word, and then at the same time holding fast to the deceit that is in your own heart? He said, why are my people holding fast? They won't let go of the deceit that is in their heart. It's amazing because God said, I said, holy prophets. He, he said, it's not because you haven't heard the word. They rose up early. I sent them early in the morning to late at night. They walked the streets. They, they wooed you by the spirit. They warned you by the spirit. And yet, in spite of all of that, you hold on to your deceit. Folks, if you have deceit in your heart of this church, it's not because, if you've been sitting in this church hearing the gospel preached from this pulpit, it's not because you haven't been warned. It isn't because you haven't heard the truth. But he says, why do you still hold on to that thing? Why do you still hold on to that one thing that I've been dealing with? Why won't you let it go? In this case, it was blatant idolatry. The people rejected the call of the prophets. They hardened their hearts. They clamored for a message that was soothing. They said, preach us easy words, soothing words. Oh, beloved, I can name you churches in this city right now while I'm standing here. Now, maybe not at this particular hour, but every Sunday morning you can go to some of the famous churches in this city and you will not hear one single word that would upset you. It will not raise a hair on your head. It will not raise a conviction in your soul. It will soothe you. You could live in any kind of sin and go in there and feel good about it and walk out feeling even better. Because the man who stands in the pulpit, I tell you right now, is a false prophet. If he will not preach against sin, if he will not show people their iniquities, if he will not deal with the deceit of the heart, he's a false prophet. He has nothing to say. And the only people who go to those kind of churches are those who don't want their sins dealt with. And if they go to a church where the gospel is truly being preached, they walk out and say, that's legalism. And they get angry. Beloved, I see a spirit that's in the church today. The condition described in Jeremiah 8 is a condition today. God's people saved, baptized with the Holy Ghost, still holding fast to deceit, under great delusion, hoping to serve the Lord and still serve their secret sins. Let me make this very personal. We're not talking now about the children of Israel in Jerusalem in Jeremiah's time. We're not talking about those of the Old Testament, not even the New Testament. We're talking about 1996, the last Sunday of 1996. We're talking Times Square Church, David Wilkerson, and this congregation, and all who hear me. Are you sitting here in the presence of God now? The Holy Spirit was moving here mightily in a beautiful way. He came down now just to, to honor 
Christ, Holy Spirit, is always here to honor Jesus. And he's honored Jesus in our midst, and the glory of the Lord was here. Did you sit through all of this? Did you praise the Lord? Did you have your hands up? Did you worship Him today with sin clinging to your heart? Something He dealt with time and time again and you still will not lay it down? You still cling? You still hold fast to the deceit that God by His Spirit is dealing with? That's what God is asking Jeremiah. How can my people come in my presence and worship me and seek my word and still hold fast to their deceit? How can it be that so many Christians today can worship the Lord and, and continue, I mean, month after month and even year after year and not deal? Through their sin. In Jeremiah 8, 5, he says, Why do my people fast the deceit? Why do they not repent and return to holiness? Why did they... In fact, the description is given by God to the prophet Jeremiah. Why do they race off after their sins like horses going to battle? Those horses would, would go against those stays and absolutely puncture themselves. They were rushing into the battle, the sound of battle. There was something in their blood rushing into their sin, rushing into the battle. And folks, he said, that's what my people are doing. They're like wild horses running into the battle, holding fast to the sea, running to destruction, destroying themselves. In verse 7, God answers his own question. And he said, why do, why do my people hold fast to the deceit? And he answers it. It is because my people know not my judgments. And God is saying, I warned them that I would judge their sins. I would pour up my wrath upon those who refuse to forsake their wicked ways. I sent a message after message. I have been patient. We have, we have Christians who believe God can't, there's no end to God's patience. Folks, you, you would know your Bible if you believed that. You would not know your Bible. There comes a time when God says, you have hardened your heart. Nothing I say, nothing I do, nothing I could do, even as God of the universe, will change you. And God talks of giving people over to their sin to reprobate minds. Folks, we are going to have to deal with the reality of the Scripture in these last days. The truth alone that can set us free. Somebody can come to you and talk to you about your sin, but until you allow the Holy Ghost to take this word and cause you to tremble at it, you will never be delivered from your sin. Especially now, if you have cozied up to it, become your bosom sin, and you're comfortable with it now. God had warned severe judgment upon those who flaunted his mercy, and he said, I will overturn, overturn, overturn. That was the end of his patience. He said, I will overturn. I, I will deal with this. This people were, uh, judgment was already coming because uh, the Assyrian army had already approached to the, the north border, border in Dan. And they, they said, we can hear the neighing of their horses. These are the Israelites talking who had idolatry in their heart and the stumbling blocks of iniquity in them. And they, they, they were running, fleeing to their cities for the walled cities. And what they were saying, we will run to the cities and we will sit in silence and wait to see what God will do. And what they're saying, we'll go into these walled cities and we will sit and ride out the judgment. God had warned them by the prophets. He said, your sin will find you out. He said, there's judgment on sin. I've been patient. I've wooed you. You're my children. I'm your father. I love you. But you will not heed. You will not listen. He said, there comes a time I have to deal, I have to judge. And God was judging, the Assyrian armies were coming, those prancing horses, they were killing wives and babies and children, everything in sight was being wiped out, and the word came all through Judah and Israel, and they were fleeing to the cities, and they were saying, let us enter into the defense cities and let us sit silent. God has given us water of gall to drink, because we've sinned against the Lord. And folks, they didn't know the judgment of God. They didn't have the slightest idea what was coming. Their concept was we will run into these walled cities and 
There will be a time of trouble. There may not be enough food to eat. There may be a time of no drink. We may be a little thirsty. We may have a time of trial, but we will ride out the storm. And there are people now, I mentioned speaking to a pastor who was involved in outright slander and gossip. And I approached him about it. And I said, do you know your Bible? Do you not understand that God can cut you off? That all through the book of Proverbs, he said, I will chew you to pieces. I will deal with you. I said, do you understand that the judgment of God is on slander, whether you're a preacher or anybody else? And he turned and waved it off and he said, all right, then I face the judgment of God. And I, I, I walked away thinking, oh, if you knew what, if you only knew the judgment of God, you couldn't say that. You couldn't say that. He didn't know anything about the judgment of God. He had no concept of the judgment of God. You can't sit silent and ride out the judgments of God upon your sin. You can't say, all right, and this is what they were saying. We have sinned against God. We have failed God. We, we have been disobedient. We've held to our secret sins. And now we're going to face a time of judgment. But we'll come out of it on the other side. They're going to hold their sins right through the judgment. And how wrong they were. Because they didn't survive the judgments of God. And there are people, Christians, who honestly believe, you know, God's merciful. He, he will... I, 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 they have no plans to lay down their sin. They have no plan to yield to the Holy Spirit. And you know, folks, all that God is asking of you is that you surrender. That's all it is. Just surrender. He's there with open arms. He's there with power. Everything you need. He's there to help you hate your sin. He's there as a loving Father, just hovering over you, waiting for your heart to reach out to Him. Just wanting you to cry, I hate my sin, Father. Come and deliver me from my sin. And He reaches down and pulls you out. But when you become stubborn, you become hardened in your sin, you become blinded to the evil of your sin, you no longer see the deceitfulness of sin. And so you, you say, all right, so I've... So judgment. What is he going to do? Is he going to, you know, all right, I might lose my job. What, what, how bad can it be? Folks, I wouldn't want to wait around for an answer to that. <clears throat> Hallelujah. I, I was thinking of a Christian man that I counseled with about a troubled marriage and he's another one of those who had left his wife because he said she's like a witch she's mean she's arrogant and I warned him that God hated divorce because I knew that's where he's headed and I said you're going to lose the blessing in favor of God I said, you're going to have God turn against you because he hates it. And, and you're, you're blatantly walking against his law. And you know what he said? I guess I'll just have to face the consequences of my action. I guess I'll just have to face the consequences. Face the consequences of the judgment of God? That man didn't know the judgments of God. My people don't know the judgment of the Lord. Like Israel, God had given his people... Many warnings about the judgment against sin in believers. Many, many warnings, but they turned those warnings aside. You know, in Romans, the second chapter, we have a very, very clear warning from God. He said, if you do the same things that you condemn in others, if you sin just like those that you condemn, your judgment is sure. He said, you that preach, you shouldn't steal. Do you steal? He said, you, you that condemn adultery in others, are you committing adultery? Do you sit here this afternoon in the middle of an affair, a secret affair nobody knows anything about but God and you? But sir, I'm going to tell you something else. You think your wife doesn't know, she knows and she'll find out. 
Because God said, be sure. What? His sin will, what? Who said that? So count your moments. Take your pleasure now because it's all going to be exposed, the Bible says. Be sure your sin will find you out. Now that's God's word. And that's a word of mercy. God puts these signs up, these warning signs. Because you see, right down that road, there's a precipice and it goes right over a brink. And God has all these signs saying, stop, danger, danger. Be sure your sin will find out. That's a dangerous sign. So God is trying to stop you from going over the brink. It's all mercy. How many believe that? And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgeth them which do such things, and you do the same, that you shall escape the judgment of God? Would you go to Romans 2? Let's look at it. Romans 2. Still with me? Did I hear somebody say, Brother Wilson, you're getting hard. No, no, no. I'm preaching mercy to you. Romans 2. Would you go to verse 21? Well, let's start at verse 19. You're confident that thou, that thou thyself are died of the blind, a light to them which are in darkness, instruct of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which hast the form of knowledge and the truth of the law. Thou therefore which teachest another, teachest thou not thyself. Thou that preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal? Thou that saith a man should not commit adultery, does thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? Thou that makest thy boast of the law through breaking the law, dishonorest thou God? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you, as it, it is written. Look at me, please. He, he's speaking to Christians. He said, you're blaspheming the name of Jesus when you practice something you're preaching against. When you tell others... And folks, some of us, we allow things in our lives that we wouldn't excuse in anybody else's life. We, we allow things in life that we would condemn in others. And the Lord said, that's blasphemy among the unsaved. That is something God says, I will not endure. He said, you treasure up wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Paul said, there is no respect of persons with God. For the Lord shall judge the secrets of men heart, men's hearts by Jesus Christ. Now, let me tell you something. I'm 65 now, going on 66. And I've been preaching for many, many years since just a boy. And I've looked back over my life, and I thank God for the grace, His keeping power, how He's kept me by His grace. Many times he could have cast me aside and destroyed me. But the grace of God came. But let me tell you, I said, oh God, how is it? How is it that you have kept me these years? And there's one verse, there is absolutely one verse that has been one of my key verses all my life, all my ministry. And it's this. I just want you to listen to it. It's Proverbs 16:6. By the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. By the fear of the Lord. Folks, the church of Jesus Christ has lost the fear of God. We've made God to appear like a man like ourselves, just like us. And we judge our sins as though God were somebody just like us that would appease us. That if we would cry and say, I'm so sorry, we'd go sin again, cry and repent, sin again, cry and repent, sin again. You say, after all, he said, we're to forgive 70 times 7. Well, I, I, I've got this habit, I've got this secret sin in my life, and I, I, I may have confessed it maybe 200 times, but I've got 200 sometimes more to go. It's not what that scripture means whatsoever. God said, I am no respecter of persons. 
And here's the point, and listen closely. There are many people who hold on to their secret sins because they feel that they're special. They feel that somehow because uh, they, they, they don't hurt anybody, I've often, I've often wondered, I, I was at a church once where there was a janitor that was not a Christian and he would sit, he probably sat for 20 years hearing the gospel, hearing all the speakers and everything and never moved by God. And I thought, how do, how does a man like that hear preaching after preaching and nothing moves him? And he, and he sits back in the back of the church and just sits there unmoved. He's a janitor, he takes care of the church, and he's there watching, he's hearing, and, and after a while goes in one ear and out the other, doesn't mean anything, it's just words to him anymore. You know, because that man actually was thinking to himself, like so many, really, those drug addicts that come to this church, I'm not like them. These alcoholics and all these people get up and say that they're saved and say, I'm not that, I'm a pretty good person. And, and I, I feel in my heart that when I get before God, I'll be okay. The Lord's not going to judge me. And you see, they know nothing of the judgment of God. They know nothing that they must stand before the judgment. It's appointed unto man once to die and after that to judgment. And that is final, that is sure. But we have people that, that have absolutely, almost the whole city out here. You can take people that have not murdered anybody, people that faithfully pay their income tax. Oh, they've got their little secret things, yes. But because there's no big, blatant sin, I'm okay. And that's why they write books like, I'm okay, you're okay. <laughs> but I believe what Apostle Peter said, for the time has come that judgment must begin in the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall it be? of them that obey not the gospel of God. Now, folks, this judgment of God, let me talk to you about it for just a moment. We know so little about the fear of God today. We know so little about the judgment of God. The Bible says it's by the fear of God that we, we run from evil, that we flee from evil, from our idols. The fear of God, and you can't incubate that. You can't invent it. You can't just make it arise in your heart. That comes through sincere crying and praying out to God. The Holy Ghost has to fire that flame in you. My prayer every day is, oh God, I want your fear to blaze in me. When I stand in the pulpit, I want to, I want the fear of God blazing in me. When I go through, get up in the morning, let the fear of God be a blaze in my heart. That when the enemy comes at me with temptation and all these other things, the fear of God will be burning bright and be consumed in that fire and that blaze. Hallelujah. How many want the fear of God? The holy, righteous fear of God. You could never sin lightly. But you see, the, the judgments prophesied against God's people in Jerusalem were not eternal judgment. This was not judgments that would come to them when they die. These were judgments that come to us while they're here on earth. And these are the judgments of God. Folks, it's not just judgment on judgment day. Sin that was not confessed and forsaken, sin that is not laid down, those secret things that cling to us and grow and take root and get harder and deeper into our spirits, that's what God is after. And you know, sometimes people will ask God to pluck up one sin and one idol is knocked down and another is raised up right in its place. And God wants to take out all idolatry. He wants to take away all stumbling blocks. Hallelujah. Not knocking one down and let another coming up in its place. But you see, these judgments of God that God's people don't know anything about, he begins to explain those judgments. I'm going to give you just two evidences of those judgments, two consequences of those judgments listed in this eighth chapter. First of all, verse 10. Would you look at verse 10, please? Therefore will I give... No, first of all, it says, My people know not the judgment of the Lord. Look at verse 10. Therefore will I give their wives unto others. I will give their wives unto others. Now look at me, please. This is the judgment of, of sin, especially in the, the life of a married person. If you're married, listen to me closely. 
God says, I'll give your wives to others. This is blatant divorce. This is pandemic divorce. This is the breaking up of homes. This is the dysfunctional family, and we see it everywhere we go. Folks, the judgment of God is on America, and it's happening in the church. Did, did you get the latest news? I saw this in a, in a Christian magazine, that there are as many evangelical Christians divorcing as those that are not going to church. Just as much divorce in evangelical churches as in the world. Dysfunctional families. This is the judgment of God. He said, if you hold on to your sin, you're married and you have sin, you have lust in your heart, and you will not lay it down and you follow your idolatry, it's going to cost you your home. It's going to cost you your family. It's going to cost your children. I have seen grandparents whose children have been raised, and those two never did settle things with God. They never did have it right with God. And then when the children were gone, the children were the only thing holding it together when the children are married. God, grandma, grandpa get divorced. And you know what I've seen? Especially with ministers, grandparent ministers of the gospel. You know what I've seen over and over again? I've seen that divorce spread all through their married kids. One after another, following the example of their parents. And he said, I'll give your wives to another. The judgment of God is a dysfunctional family, a loss of children. In Malachi chapter 2, God said, You cover the altar of the Lord with your tears and with weeping and with crying out, yet you are untrue to your wives. Yet she's your companion, the wife of your covenant. You've wearied the Lord with your words. You think God still delights in them that do evil. You think God still delights in you, even though he sees what is in your heart. I, w I wonder how many wives there are listening to me now. Folks, I'm at the place now. I've told God I have to make every year count. I have to make every message count, every day count. And I, I have been faithful as I know how to be. I've, I've made mistakes, yes, I know. In, 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 in the past years, I've made mistakes. I'm not a perfect man. I want to talk to you plain and simple. It may sound blunt to you. But how many wives are sitting here right now wanting out of their marriage? How many husbands are wanting out? You're thinking of divorce. You're thinking of splitting. You're thinking of going your own way. He's, God said, you come to my house and you cover the altar with tears. And yet you're unfaithful in your heart. He's talking about what's going on in the heart. You're unfaithful in your heart. You're treachery, you have treachery in your heart. God says, I'll judge that. I will judge that. God, let it not be in this church. Let it be that every wife that's here thinking she's in an impossible situation believe that nothing is impossible with God. Let every husband that's hearing me right now not even anticipate or think about it because God hates divorce. That is not an option for a believer. It's not an option. It can't even enter your thoughts. It will cost you your home, it will cost you your children, it will cost you everything. And that's the second judgment. Verse 10, and I'll give your fields to them that shall inherit them. In the original Hebrew it says, I'll give your fields to others. Your field is, your, is the area, that, that, that whole substance of what you spent your whole life building. For me, my field is this congregation, it's the church. Pastor Carter, this is his field, New York, it's a ministry here. And God says, if you will not yield, if you will not lay down your sin, if you're going to hold to your deceit, I'll give your field to somebody else. And oh, I've seen that over and over. I've seen missionaries come home from the field. I'm dealing with a couple right now. A man overseas fell in love, he said, with somebody overseas. And his wife came home and she's in despair. 
and he's going to fly over and get her and bring her back and marry her, and it's a mess. But I've seen what happens now. That he doesn't have a dollar to his name. His ministry's been taken from him. Nobody on that field wants him. He wants to go back to that field. Nobody wants to touch him. Nobody wants near him. God said, I'll take your field away from you, and I'll give it to somebody else. I'll take away all everything you have. Folks, that's what sin does. Sin will take everything you have. You want a divorce, sir? It's going to cost you everything. It's going to cost you alimony. It's going to cost you heartache. It's going to cost you probably your car. I had a woman recently tell me that, that her husband had divorced her about 10 years ago. She said, Brother Dave, he divorced me and had every right to because I shamed him. I was not faithful. I, 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 he had every right. I sinned against my husband. And she said, I had a beautiful home, I had beautiful furniture, very expensive, everything. I lived in style. I wound up sleeping in my car. Thank God she got a hold of God and the Lord began to bless her and prosper her. She's serving the Lord now faithfully, being mightily blessed of God. But God took her fields. He'll take your fields. He'll give your best to somebody else. Uh-huh. The wages of sin. Know you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers shall inherit the kingdom of God. Marriage is honorable. The bed is undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. You say, brother, why are you talking about adultery, fornication? Because the Holy Ghost told me to deal with it. Because God's trying to save some people from hell. God's coming right to your face, face to face. Because you sit here, nobody else knows about it but you and God. Supposedly. If you're in the office, everybody knows it anyhow. They're talking behind your back. Mm hmm. And, and, and God has come face to face with you from a pastor who cares about your soul. And the Holy Ghost says, I'm speaking directly to it now that you've been convicted of it by the power of the Holy Ghost and you lay it down and get your freedom back and get the joy of the Lord back and get the blessing of the Lord flowing and all your rivers flowing once again that have been held up by your sin hallelujah don't anybody look around look in now I'm not suggesting we have many, many into this. If I'm speaking to one or two, it's worth. It's worth every word. It's worth the time to stop and talk it about. I will give your fields to them that shall inherit it. Another present judgment is an invasion of serpents and snakes. Verse 17, Behold, I will send serpents, cockatrices, among you which shall not be charmed, and they shall bite you, saith the Lord. Folks, this is God's word. This is not a pastor getting up, venting his spirit. This is God's word. God said, persist in your sin. I've loved you, I've been patient with you, but he said, it comes a time I'm warning you. Go on with it. And I'll tell you, I, I'm, you're, you're going to split your home. You're going to split everything. You're going to lose everything. I'll give your fields and your career and your business. I'm going to give everything to somebody else. And then I'm going to send serpents to bite you. And you're going to live out your days with poison in you. Bitterness. Rejection. Guilt. Shame. These serpents will bite you. God says... I will send these serpents. Verse 17, behold, read it with me. Verse 17, chapter 8. For behold, I, I, who is it? 
I will send serpents, cockatrices, or those, what, what cockatrices are, are the little snakes that are the most poisonous. Among you which will not be charmed, and they shall bite you, saith the Lord. Now what happens when you're bitten with the serpent? The poison goes all through your system. And folks, I see Christians everywhere I look now, full of poison, bitter, angry, full of rebellion. Why? Because of sin that is unsurrendered. Unsurrendered, and folks, it produces nothing but the cockatrice bite. Show me a Christian who's living with a hidden secret lust or living a double life. He refuses conviction, refuses the warnings of God's word. That Christian is going to become hard in his sin and his very character is going to change. I see people changing. Folks, probably the saddest thing that can happen in the church of Jesus Christ is that those who should be mothers in Zion, fathers in Zion, those with gray hairs who should be sweet and mellow, be a testimony to a dying world and young people looking for examples of God's grace and mercy to see them become mean and angry and bitter. Nothing, nothing is more vile in my eyes. Nothing bothers me more than to see a grandma in her 70s or 80s sucking a cigar, drinking a cocktail and cursing like a, a drunken sailor. Nothing worse than in the house of God to see grandmothers and women above 50 and 60 years of age in the house of God growing every day and every week meaner and angrier, their face creased with bitterness. And they still come to the house of God, but the serpent has bitten them because sin, unforgiveness, bitterness. And you look at them, so, Lord, their last day spent full of poison. Oh, Lord, I don't want that in my, oh, God, I don't want any poison in me. Hallelujah. I don't want any poison in my system. I want to grow sweeter as the days go by. Hallelujah. what happened to Saul, didn't it? He had bitterness and jealousy and hatred in his heart. An evil spirit from the Lord came upon him. That man died face to face with a witch full of anger, bitterness, and rebellion. And, and, and folks, it's the, the thing that robbed these people was that they knew not the judgment of the Lord. And, with, and I'm going to close with this, but this is so important. Verse 8, please. Verse 8. I'm going to come to the close now. How do you say we are wise and the law of the Lord is with us? Though certainly in vain made he it, the pen of the scribes is in vain. And in the original Hebrew, the pen of the scribes is a lying pen. What the, what the scribes and the priests and the prophets are preaching now, Jeremiah, God is telling Jeremiah, they're not preaching the truth. They're saying, we are wise. Look, it says, we are wise and the law of the Lord is with us. The, the, here, look at this picture, please. Jerusalem is bound by idolatry. The judgment of God is at the door. People know nothing of the judgment of God. And they're in their midst. They are being charmed by a false gospel. And you know, these scribes said, we know the law. They bisected the law. They said, we are wise in the law. We know what the law means. But you know what they did? They perverted the law. They took away the power and the sting of the law. Folks, we are not under the law as a way of salvation, but we are under the law as a moral code. God has not done away with the law. He has honored the law by his absolute perfect righteousness. He has exalted the law as a moral standard. That is our standard. Tell me which one of the Ten Commandments you're not to obey anymore. Give me one. Commandment of God of the Ten that you're not supposed, you and I are not supposed to obey anymore. We are not saved by the law, but it's still our moral code. 
But you see, they've taken away the law. They took away the law and they were saying, peace, peace. We have the law on our side and they were telling people were evil and corrupted that you are a righteous person. You are righteous people. Beloved, let me tell you something. There was a time I was probably one of the hardest preachers in America. I've told Pastor Carter sometimes I listened to my tapes from 20 years ago and I have to shut it off. I, I said, I can't handle that. Because you see, the Lord had to add mercy and grace. And he, he, he seasoned it with mercy and grace. And I've preached a lot of mercy. You've heard Pastor Carter preach great mercy and love. We have preached mercy. We've talked to you about a heavenly father who loves us, who's a nurse to us. We've talked to you about being justified and sanctified by faith. We've talked to you about how, how Jesus Christ is the only righteousness. We have no other plea but his righteousness. Because you see, even when you lay your idols down, even when you can say there's nothing between me and the Lord, it's still not your goodness. It's the mercy and the grace of God and nothing else. But folks, that's one side of this coin. There's another side to the coin. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. There, there are so many scriptures here. They said the law of the Lord is with us. And we hear some people preaching what they believe is the truth. But it's all mercy. It's all love. It's all grace. It's all, uh, don't worry. You're okay. Listen to what the word says. Listen closely now. Lay aside the sin that so easily besets you. Lay it aside. Now, folks, that's not the law. That's grace. You've got a sin in your life. Lay it aside. Deal with it. Listen to what the Scripture says. Cleanse yourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. And God means that. Perfecting holiness in the fear of God. That's not law. That's not legal. That is mercy. That is grace. He says, but fornication, all uncleanness, all covetousness, let it not once be named among you. And then he says, come out from among them, be you separate and clean, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. Then I receive you as my, as a father. You'll be my son. You'll be my daughter. Then I receive you. That's the word too. Now, I tell you always, we close with hope. Now, I want you to go with me, if you will, please, to Psalm 103. Will you stand as we read it? Psalm 103. Did you hear what I said this morning? The judgments of God are not vindictive, they're redemptive. He judges us to save us. Paul said, I turned him over to the devil, to the destruction of the flesh, that his soul might be saved. Judgment to redeem. Hallelujah. Do you have Psalm 103? All right, let's, let's begin reading verse 10 from King James I'm reading. He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so hath he removed our transgressions from us. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. He knoweth our frame, he remembers that we are but dust. As for man, his days are as grass, as a flower of the field, so he flourisheth. The wind passeth over it, and it's gone, and the place thereof shall be no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. Upon whom? Upon them that fear him and his righteousness unto children's children. To who? To such as keep his covenant and to those that remember his commandments to do them. Folks, what is his commandment? Confess and forsake your sin. Touch not the unclean thing. I say this the last thing I want to say to you this afternoon. I know some of you are battling uh, a horrible battle. You say, Pastor David, I'm convicted. 
I'm deeply convicted. I know what it says here. The mercy of God is upon them that fear him and those who keep his commandments and remember to do them. But I don't have the power. I keep falling. Here, here's the issue. Listen close. Here's the issue. Don't make peace with that sin. Don't say, I'm going to live with it. So, oh God, put it in my heart to hate it. Help me to keep battling. God has never once ever turned away his heart from somebody. No matter how deep in sin they are, no time in history has God ever turned his back or cast away a Christian or a sinner who hates his sin. He has never turned away from those who cry out for deliverance. You may not have it yet, but you're crying out for deliverance. God sees that. He will come. He will bring deliverance. Because that's what your heart yearns and cries for. Don't lose that cry. He's not going to fail you. He's going to deliver you. Now, folks, I've, I've, I've preached along this line this morning, again this afternoon. But God's trying to lead this church into the greatest uh, arena of worship and praise that you and I have ever witnessed. The glory of the Lord wants to come down in this church as he's doing it in many churches today. But he can't do that until we come to him with clean hands and a pure heart and nothing, absolutely nothing hidden in our lives. That you come to church and you raise your hands and you know that you're clean. You know that you have come and laid your sin at the foot of the cross and said, Jesus, here it is. I don't want it. I give it to you. I surrender it to you. Now you give me the grace. You give me the power. You keep, you keep me hating this sin. He's going to rush in. Now I'll tell you, nobody going to have to pump up anything. The choir's not going to have to pump you up. The orchestra, no song leader have to pump you up. Folks, you'll come to this church and you'll be running. I mean, you will come with your hands up and you'll be running in mercy and grace. And there'll be a conviction. There'll be a conviction upon everybody that comes in just because of the awesome presence of the Lord. And you talk about joy. Nobody has joy like people who've been set free. Nobody. You guys from Timothy House and the girls over here from Sarah House and everybody else been delivered from sin and the power of sin. You may be struggling about it, but I'll tell you right now, so oh God, I mean it when I tell you I want to hate this. I don't want to go back. Keep me, Lord, from falling. Present me faultless before your throne with exceeding great joy. And when you follow that and pray every day and get into this word, you won't be standing there anymore. You'll be jumping all over the place with joy and victory like you've never known. Hallelujah. I understand some of you have been doing that up there anyhow. Amen. Yes. Holy Spirit. Mm. Bring the hammer down on us. We thank you, Lord, that that hammer is held by a velvet glove of love. Hallelujah. Lord, I pray for everyone in this building that's been battling a besetting sin that has been holding them back from the fullness of God. It's been such a burden. It's robbed them of such freedom. God, let there be total, final victory in this house today. Nobody needs to know what it is. You just get out of your seat up in the balcony here in the main floor. Hey, there's victory. There's victory today, right now. There's victory within the next 10 minutes. Yes, there is. Get out of your seat. Just get out of your seat. Bring it to God. If you're backslidden, if you don't know Jesus, or if you've got this, this thing that you're battling, bring it to the Lord right now. The Bible says open confession. Open confession. Open confession. Lord, I confess it. I'm not ashamed. I come to you now, Lord. 
please move in close, those that are coming. Up in the balcony, I said, just go to the stairs on either side. Satisfied sinners. I'm thinking tonight of a young mother I used to see pushing a baby carriage up in Harlem, and it bothered me because she had black and blue marks on her. And she stopped me one day and said, aren't you the man working with drug addicts? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, then, sir, you've got to get to my husband, Hector. He's one of the worst drug pushers. He's a maniac. He beats me up. He abuses the baby. He's going to kill us. Please get to him. Now, we usually don't work like that. We prefer they get desperate and come to us for help. But out of pity for that mother, we went to Hector and told him about our program and said, when you get desperate, come and see me. And a few weeks later, in a point of desperation, Hector came. We took him into the program. It lasted eight months to a year. And while Hector was in the program, in a rehabilitation program, I'd see his wife, Carla, in the streets. And she'd say, how's Hector doing? I'd say, Carla, we're going to send a new man back to your home. He's going to be the father and husband he should be. He's going to have love in his heart. And friends, that's exactly what happened. Eight months later, we sent Hector home, a Bible under one arm and a box of candy under the other. And I'll tell you, it gave me joy to know that we were sending a young man home that wasn't a maniac. Now, he wasn't a drug daddy. He didn't smoke. He didn't drink. But more than that, he said he was going all the way with Christ. I felt so good about it. Two weeks later, I got the shock of my life. I was walking in a back alley, worked with some junkies, and there's Hector on the corner, on the curb, dirty, filthy, back on the needle, worse than ever. I was horrified. I said, Hector, what in the world happened to you? He said, why don't you go home and ask my wife, Carla? I said, what do you mean? He said, David, I went home determined I was going to live it. He said, but you know, I got home, my wife's a chain smoker, and it bothered me. I said, look, Carla, I, I can quit drugs and smoking. I can expect you to quit blowing smoke in my face. I want you to quit smoking, and I want you to quit running around with all those wicked housewives on the block of those parties, and I want you to quit drinking. She blew up at me, he said. He's, she said, who in the world do you think you are? Why, you dirty, filthy sinner. You come in here now and get a little religion and come in here and start preaching at me. She said, you make me nervous. I don't like you like this. I like you better the way you were before. And boy, she started henpecking him and henpecking him for two weeks, trying to seduce him back to the needle, and went out finally and bought two bags of heroin, threw it on the kitchen table with a set of work, said, shoot it up. I want you back the way you were. He said, David, I couldn't face it myself. I need help at home. I couldn't fight it alone. And to this day, I don't understand why a young housewife in Harlem prefers a drug addict crazed husband to a man of God. And yet, see, Carla was satisfied in her sins. The light that he'd received condemned her darkness, and she'd have nothing to do with it. I'm thinking, too, of another uh, situation when I had heard of a young boy living like a dog in a basement. They described it to him, and I couldn't believe it. A 17-year-old boy whose parents had died when he was 12 years old, he'd run away because he didn't want the welfare department to put him in institution. He found an old tenement house, a dilapidated tenement house, and the superintendent let him sleep in the basement if he'd do some chores and take care of the furnace. And the boy was 17 years old when I found him, a heroin addict, and I went in the basement, a dark, dirty, rat, and roach-infested basement, filthy, damp, and dark. And there in a corner, he had it fixed up like a little room. He had a pile of rags that he slept on. He had a calendar on the wall that was two years old, a picture of his mother, and a candle. And this was his room. I looked around, and there he was, sitting over in another corner, high as he could be. His eyeballs were yellow. He was full of hepatitis and jaundice, 17 years old, an animal. He hadn't bathed in months. He ate junk food, robbed and stole for money to support his habit. We picked that boy up. I couldn't believe that in America we had kids living like dogs. I picked him up. We put him in the car and took him to the center and cleaned him up. Uh, the cook got him a good hot meal. The first hot meal he'd had, I'm sure, in months. Took him into the chapel. Showed him what Christ had done for other junkies. He, he said, I want to try. And friends, that night at midnight, we put Manny to bed in new pajamas, beautiful clean sheets, nice downy soft pillow, and two boys to stay up with him all night to help him kick cold turkey, wipe the sweat from his brow to pray with him. And I'd been gone a few weeks and went down to my office after putting him in the room with the boys. 
And I was dictating some letters in a dictaphone machine about two o'clock. I flipped it off and leaned back in the chair. And I thought of that boy up in that room. And I thought of boys like Nicky Cruz. And I thought, now, Lord, that's pure religion and undefiled. And there's nothing in the world that brings such a sense of, of, of fulfillment as to be a part of this wonderful scheme of God's grace. And I thought, oh, Lord, if, with all the problems, this makes it worth at all. And I conjured in my mind, uh, maybe another Nicky Cruz, sending him to college. And, and one day, a man of God walking back in the street and saying, there's where God found me. And I felt so good. About 2 o'clock, or 2.30 rather, I heard a blood-curdling scream. My office opened to the main lobby. And I went to the door just in time to see Manny running out the door, throwing on his clothes, screaming like a wild man. I chased him down the block. He went down the subway. A train arrived, and he went off into the night. I missed the train. Went back to the center and asked him what had happened. They said, we don't know. He, did. he was sleeping. He woke up. He grabbed his clothes, screaming, and ran. The next day... I went up to Harlem, into the basement. He wasn't there. I looked all over, all over five or six blocks, and finally found him in a little cafe, drinking a cup of coffee. He tried to run when he saw me. I said, Manny, look, why'd you run out on me? Come on, my car's out there. Let's get back. He said, no, sir, and I want you to leave me alone. He said, you did a terrible thing to me last night. I said, what do you mean? He said, mister, I don't have much left in life, but the little I've got left, you took away from me. And I, I thought of that calendar and a picture of his mother and, and uh, the candle. I thought, well, we could get that stuff if that's what he's relating to. He said, mister, and I'll never forget it, you took my security. I said, you're what? He said, my security. He said, that's just a, a, a hole in the wall to you. But he said, for four years, that's been my home, and I've grown accustomed to it. And to tell you the truth, I like it. He said, I like shooting drugs. I like living in that basement. Don't you understand? I didn't want to go with you. I was sick. He said, you fed me, that's nice. You're being a good man, you're trying to help people, that's fine. But he said, I don't want your help, don't you understand? You put me in new pajamas, in a clean bed, I hadn't slept in a mattress for years. He said, I woke up, I was so miserable, I felt my body was crawling with worms. He said, I was miserable. He said, please, don't you understand? I'm satisfied, just the way things are. And I had to walk out after an hour. He wouldn't listen, I, I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I got in a car, and I shook my head and said, I don't believe it, how a kid can prefer a rat-infested basement to the love we were trying to give him. And the tragedy is, friends, and this is documented in one of my books. Manny died six months later in the Brooklyn Hospital, cirrhosis of the liver. And I've never forgotten his faith. You see, to me, Manny and Carla represent a whole new breed of sinner that, that we are uh, breeding in America today. I call the satisfied sinner. You see, the way I interpret my Bible, there are only two kinds of sinners, sorry sinners and satisfied. Now, David sinned grievously against God, yet he said, I repent of my sins. I'm sorry. I'll forsake my wicked ways. That's godly sorrow that leads to repentance. But you see, we have a breed of sinner in America now who, who, who won't come to Christ because they have the idea in their mind that some strange, mysterious power has overwhelmed them and they can't help it. They are a victim. You see, have you ever heard this? The devil made me do it. I couldn't help it. This strange, mysterious power keeps pushing me on. I don't want to be like this, but I can't help it. And I've prayed about this, friends, and the Holy Spirit's been saying some things to me I want to, I want to say here tonight. First of all, there's no such thing as a victim of sin, only volunteers. Almost every drug addict that comes to us for help now has been to his local psychiatrist and he's had a perfect alibi given to him as to why he's a junkie. I had a 16-year-old kid come to me and I said, look, why does a 16-year-old kid stick a dirty needle in his vein? You're only 16 years old. You know better. He said, well, Mr. Wilson, I'll tell you, it's very traumatic. He said, my problem is I've got interpersonal relationships, intensified anxiety states, and sibling rivalries. I said, who told you that? He said, my psychiatrist. He said, you see, Mr. Wilson, I can't help uh, what I am. I, I'm a victim of poverty. He said, I got caught up in the poverty syndrome. You see, I'd have preferred to have been born out in a nice suburb where there was love and a couple cars in the garage, but I got stuck in this ghetto, and I can't help it. I didn't ask to be born down here. This is where I've been put. I can't help it. Can't you see? Society put this on me. And friend, I can take you 
I'm not about to tell you that poverty and unemployment and the ghetto are not contributing factors to dragging a soul down. But I can take you to Harlem and show you kids sleeping in hell. Mom's a prostitute, dad's a drug pusher, brothers and sisters are all smashed and stoned on drugs, yet that kid's a man of God and he's going to go to Bible school and preach the gospel in spite of his environment. And I can take you right here to Denver, some of the most influential suburbs, and show you beautiful $100,000 and $200,000 homes with three, four, and five cars in the driveway, and parents who love their kids and their kids going straight to hell in spite of their good environment. I'm a victim. Almost every man who, who cheats on his wife today and commits adultery becomes a fornicator. Instead of calling him by his right name, a fornicator and adulterer, we try to rationalize, we try to uh, dialogue with the problem and, and try to give him an excuse. And it goes something like this. Well, now, have you seen his wife? She's a witch. Well, if you were married to that, you'd run out and find somebody to understand you too. All the man wanted was somebody to understand him. And all the cheat in the world, and everybody says, all I want is somebody to understand me. Hogwash. Well, you city people don't know what that means. That's pig's food. I've been working with homosexuals for 20 years. We've had a home for homosexuals for 12 years now in upstate New York. A wonderful man of God delivered from homosexuality. Married now a happy family man. And, and we baptized uh, this past year, seven that have been delivered. And I believe that Christ is the cure. But friends, out of the thousands and thousands I've ministered to, only two out of a hundred have ever been reached or helped at all because only two out of a hundred were willing to quit blaming somebody for their problem. Ask any homosexual, how did you become a homosexual? Mother did it. My mother did it. I had a mean father and I had a permissive, pampering mother. You just ask my psychiatrist, he'll tell you. Mm hmm. It's almost a sin to be a parent today. Mother did it. Dad did it. My friends, this, this is all over the country now. Do you remember this mass homosexual murder down in Houston? 25 boys, little boys were murdered and buried in cellophane garbage bags. And I have a film clip of the police digging up those bodies. And they just captured young Henley boy who'd been a part of these murders and confessed it. And he's leaning over a police car talking on the phone to his mother. And before they even get the boy to jail, a psychiatrist is talking to reporters in Houston and saying, now this boy is a product of a permissive society. We all made him what he is. He couldn't really help it. Not a one word about the stacks of pornographic smut they found in the boy's room. Not one word of the fact that he was an alcoholic. And not one word of the fact that he'd been going to sex orgies for years. No, we made him what he was. You know, all the time I have parents come to me to ask me to visit their kids in jail. And very seldom do I get an honest parent who comes and says, David, my kid did wrong. He got in trouble. My boy's in jail. He's paying for his penalty, his crime. But I love him. Go visit him, please. Now, I respond to that kind of honesty. But you know what I get? Almost all the time. Brother Dave, please go visit my boy in jail. Or my boy wouldn't hurt a flea. So help me, they're persecuting him. It's a communist conspiracy. It's Watergate. That's what it is. I am so sick and tired of Watergate. You know, we've got a man sitting down in San Clemente that is acting like a second savior for the United States, and we're piled up all the national conscience on one man who's sitting there, and I'll tell you, friends, there are more hypocrites and there are more false prophets in Washington doing more now than Nixon ever did making him look like a Sunday school picnic. And I'm so sick and tired of everybody blaming everything on one man. I'm not a Nixon man, but I'm telling you, every time somebody wants to shade their own hanky-panky, Watergate! Well, friends, let me say it again. There are no victims of sin, only volunteers. My Bible says, remember the words of the apostles, how they warned you. Men should become lovers of pleasure, covetous, disobedient to parents, drawn away by the lust of their own hearts sensuous, separating themselves, having not the spirit, drawn away by the lust of their own heart, not by a pusher, not by a hooker, not by a Watergate, wicked politicians. Kids today who are smoking, drinking, running around and carousing and sticking needles in their veins are not running from somebody or something. They are following the lust and the dictates of their own heart. They're doing exactly what they want to do. The Bible said they're volunteers. 
drawn away by the lust of their own heart. They're sensuous. Americans have become sensuous. And the Bible said they separate themselves. Well, you go to a local high school party, you know what the Lord's talking about, how they separate themselves into their own little group. Why, well, I'm sure you don't go to high school parties, but I go wherever kids will listen. And you go to average high school uh, or college party today, and over here in one corner, all the potheads and the pillheads are all congregated, and they're all jiving on drugs. Now, you know what jiving is, but, you know, and, and the shades, and always... If they're on pills or horse, they're pulling their nose and scratching their ears. And they're all jiving about drugs. See, they have a secret thing among them. They're all doing the same thing. They're all popping pills. They're sucking grass. And they're saying, hey, man, I got me joint last night. Heavy, man. Heavy, heavy, heavy. Everything. Heavy, man. And then over here in the other corner, all the six-packers. Listen. You ask, you ask any high school kid in this place right now, the biggest thing in high school in Denver, Colorado, this state in the United States, is cruising and drinking, saving up money and getting enough six packs and go cruising. You go down to your town right down here now tonight and tomorrow, hundreds and hundreds of cars, teenagers just going back and forth, drinking Coors beer and throwing the cans out the window. Hey, you hear kids saying, I'm dropping out of society. You know how the kids drop out of society in 1976? In a $7,000 Dodge van with stereo. I wish I could drop out like that. Dropping out. Then over here in the other corner, all the spoochers and the petters. And they're looking around winking at anybody. You can always find your own kind. They're always around. And they connect. And they say, hey, this party's a drag that split. Get in the car, go to a local driving movie, crawl in the back seat, and start making out. And that's exactly what the Bible says. They separate themselves. They're sensuous. They're drawn away by the lust of their own heart. And I've never been able to help anybody in 20 years until they say, this is my problem, and quit blaming somebody else and say, hey, look right in the mirror. In all honesty, say, this is a monkey on my back. I'm responsible. It's my problem. And quit blaming somebody else for what's happened to you. There's no strange power that's overwhelmed you. No, you're drawn away by the lust of your own heart. You're doing exactly what you want to do. Secondly, the satisfied sinner continues in his sin because he doesn't believe God will ever judge him. You see, he only sees the mercy side of Christ. Oh, how people love to go to church today and hear soft, easy preaching about thinking things through in a positive way. Everything is up, is coming, roses. And oh, how we love to hear about the sympathizing Jesus. Well, if I were a sinner and I had, if I had a hang up in my, I'd like to go to church and hear the preacher not jab me about my sin, but tell me how Jesus loves the sinner. And, and you see, that, that's a part of Christ. I've been preaching for 20 years up and down the streets of this nation around the world. I've been preaching mercy and love to sinners, prostitutes, charlots, and junkies. But friends, I know the other side. I know the goodness and the severity of God. But all there are a lot of sinners today like to hear how, how Jesus, see, they picture Jesus as the he-man who understands that everybody should have a little weakness in their heart. The man who forgives heart, it's right on the spot, who goes around quoting from David, if God marked iniquities among us could stand, he knows our frame, he remembers that we're dust. Oh, how they like to see Jesus driving the money changers or the establishment out of the temple. They like to picture Jesus going to parties, turning water into wine. And all the wine guzzlers in America quote that at me, and Jesus turned the water into wine. Mm hmm. And that wasn't grape juice, that was wine. Hmm. No, the world today likes to hear about the sympathizing Jesus as if to say, well, Jesus understands this weakness in me. He knows I've tried and I can't help myself. So when I get before the judgment bar of Christ, he's going to understand that because he's loving, he's patient. He came to seek and to save the lost. He, and I'm one of those sinners that had a portion of his grace, but he knows that I just can't handle this. And oh, how we love to see this sympathizing side of Jesus. But there's nothing in my Bible that says Christ came to call sin. He loved the sinner, but he said he came to call sinners to repentance. But you see, friends, we're creating a wrong image of God on the American conscience. We've created in our minds through preaching from backslidden pulpits and through our permissive way of life in America. We have created an image of God who is weak, who allows hanky-panky, who allows anything to go as long as you don't hurt anybody in the process. As long as it's a personal problem and you're not hurting somebody else, you can live with it. And so, consequently, most people say, well, everybody's got a hang-up. 
I don't understand the kind of preaching in America that allows American conscience to believe that God is putting up with what we're having in America to allow what happened in Dallas, Texas this past summer. You may or may not know that there's an all-homosexual church in America called the Metropolitan Community Churches. They now claim over 50,000 members. They've made application to the World Council of Churches. And the tragedy is that the United Church of Christ two months ago at their General Assembly voted to accept homosexuals as ordained ministers in the United Church of Christ. Three major denominations now have established study committees with a dialogue with the homosexual churches in view of ordaining homosexual pastors. Well, friends, they had their Holy Ghost Convention, they called it, in Dallas, Texas this past summer. 2,000 delegates. These are ministers from these churches and their delegates. They called it their Holy Ghost Annual Convention. Now, I couldn't go because they know what I stand for and they'd have kicked me out. So I sent my mother as an underground delegate. My mother is a great ordained minister of the gospel, and she loves people. She doesn't care whether you're homosexual or drug addict. She'll preach the same message in love. Now, friends, I believe in having compassion on homosexuals. I've preached that for years and more understanding in the church. But my message has always been as Christ is the cure, not an excuse. And that the church must never establish a dialogue with the doctrine of devils. But my mother brought back to me a tape recording of that convention. And I've never heard the Hallelujah Chorus sung with such enthusiasm. Power in the blood, I shall not be moved. And then to hear the evangelist stand and misquote from the, from the, from Romans. And you see, the indictment against the homosexual community has been Romans. And they changed that which is natural into unnatural desires and God gave them over to reprobate minds. But they say, that's not us. We didn't change anything. We were born this way. That can't be referring to us. That's someone else in society. And see how subtle the enemy is? Say, that's not you. You were born. You couldn't help it. You were created. You were a victim. So this does not point at you. And to hear the misquote, and I heard them say, God has delivered this generation to do as they please. You can be a homosexual. Come out of your closet and worship the Lord. You can talk in tongues. You can do anything and remain as a homosexual. And the thing that bothers me, friends, my mother laid on my desk blushing the registration packet she got. And every delegate got the same pack she got, 2,000 of them. You know what was in that packet? And this blows my mind. Uh, the course sheet and uh, program and two all-nude magazines of nude men and a list of all the gay bars in Dallas, Texas, so that after the meeting you could go out and get drunk and connect. These are ministers. You see, Fred, what has happened to the American conscience, this kind of hypocrisy, we, be, we, are, we, we believe that God's going to let us get away with this, that we're on some fortress island, and God, when we reach the fast point, that homosexuals is in Sodom flock that which is sacred and holy, that we can get by with it. And we've created in our consciousness in America the fact that God is so weak he'll not deal with sin anymore. There's another kind of hypocrisy, friend, that I don't understand. And these are parents who put their kids down for smoking pot, and they smoke one lucky strike after another. You know, there'll be a, uh, a story in the local newspaper about a drug bust in a local school. And here's dad and mom. They just had supper, and after supper, out comes the cocktail, and out come the cigarettes and the coffee. And they're all lit up, you know, and half stoned. And it goes something like this. Hey, honey, Puff, did you see Puff that thing in the paper, Puff, those... Crazy kids in high school, Puff, blowing that pot stuff, Puff. Man, dirty, filthy commies, Puff. What in the world does this world come to, Puff? We never did that, Puff, when we were kids, Puff. Puff. So we never did that, man. What's the world coming to? Those crazy kids, Puff. Suck. Now, I watched some of you people coming in here tonight. You couldn't come in and listen to me for one hour till you lit up your cigarette. And you're sitting here now with a pack in your pocket or purse, and you're sitting here like a worm in a bucket of hot ashes, and you'd smoke right now if I'd let you. And you can't wait to get out of here, and you people who smoke are as hooked as any drug addict I've ever worked with. I, I would, and, and tell you, something else, hold, hold it please. You know, some, something else that bothers me, something that really bothers me, I call them puffin' prophets. Preachers who stand in the pulpit and say, kids, don't smoke pot, don't use drugs, Jesus can keep you clean. And those poor kids sit there scratching their heads and then so why can't he keep you clean? I was in a crusade recently and I noticed the chairman going lower, lower in his seat. I didn't know he smoked. 
He said, you sure got me in trouble last night preaching like that. My two teenage sons went home and threw all my pipes in the fireplace. I said, I tell you, he's, your kids are trying to say something for you. You may not think smoking or drinking is sinful. Well, we do. You want us to quit smoking pot? We want you to quit smoking cigarettes. What you're sucking is just liquid pot anyhow. And what we need in America is a good old-fashioned Holy Ghost mouthwash. That's right. We need parents who will quit being such hypocrites. All the hypocrisy of the American system now. I reach it everywhere. It's almost impossible for me to preach against drugs in the colleges and high school campuses because of parental and pastoral hypocrisy anymore. The kids will come back to me. You know, the United States government, for example, has one agency that says you can't advertise cigarettes on television anymore, and you advertise right on the packet. Surgeon General's determined smoking to be harmful to your health. Isn't that nice? Agency of our government saying don't smoke, it'll kill you. And another agency of the same federal government last year spent $133 million buying cigarettes for Food for Peace projects to send our cancer by the cart overseas. How do you like that for double standards? How about the school district in Mississippi a few months ago put out a rule that no high school kids could smoke on the campus for the whole district, and the third morning they could be expelled. You know the hypocrisy of it all? They had just spent 30000 for a smoking lounge for the teachers. Hypocrisy! No wonder our kids don't listen. I say this, if you want to smoke and drink, that's between you and God, but you've abdicated your right to preach morals to your kids. Mm-hmm. Put that in your pipe and smoke. Sure glad I got my offering. Now, look, friends, I'm not trying to be cute. I mean it with all my heart. I would tell you another kind of hypocrisy. All you people sitting there saying, give it to them, Davey. Yeah, those smokers, those drinkers, I got something for you. And talk about television. Now, I know some of his old boy, he's a clothesline preacher. Now, he's one of those holiness preachers. Since when's holiness a dirty word? Now, friends, I don't believe in our, I believe in the imputed righteousness of Christ. I believe that when Christ comes into my life, he becomes my righteousness. He is my holiness. He does not put in me a seed of holiness. He is the holiness. He does not try to extract holiness from me. He has become my holiness and my righteousness, my justification, my sanctification. He's become all the fullness of the Godhead through Christ. But friends, I don't understand the hypocrisy. I've been warning American people now since 1973 when I put out a book called The Vision. I warned of a flood of filth in America. I warned of a flood of filth. Did you see this week's cover of Time Magazine? The porno plague in America. I read it and wept. I've never read anything so powerful in my life. How America, and these are liberals who said, we don't understand what's happened. These are liberal, most liberal minds saying, this is not turning out the way we thought it would. In 1973, I warned American people that there was going to be a baptism of filth on America. And I saw the prophecy of the prophet Nahum coming to pass. Behold, saith God, I will pour abominable filth upon you. That doesn't mean that God has a reservoir of smut and filth stored up. No, the devil does, and the Holy Ghost has been the floodgates holding it back, restraining it. But now the restraining ministry of the Holy Spirit is being lifted because the world is clamoring for nudity and perversion and filth and smut and, and perversion. And God says, all right, that's what you want. That's what you'll get. You're going to be baptized with it. I warned Americans that there was a ship in a New York harbor with $10 million worth of the worst smut to ever come out of Copenhagen. That's already just flooding the United States market. I warned that on television, after midnight, on cable, we'd have X-rated movies. Fifteen American cities now have X-rated movies. New York City is called the Blue, uh, the Blue Service, Blue Series. They have the same Blue Series up in Toronto. They have it in uh, 14 American cities now. Recently, the Devil Miss Jones and Deep Throat played on, on cable on a number of cities in America through college campuses. I had been warning Americans that we'd have full nudity on primetime television. Three weeks ago, NBC had their first full-time nudity and toplessness, and they called it a medical nudity. You see, they're coming in. It's called medical nudity, how to discover uh, cancer. And this was the first trial balloon, and now, friends, it's just opening an avalanche. And, friends... I've been saying all along that we were going to have programs that were programmed right in the pits of hell, and the programs like Maud, All in the Family, Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman, would compete with one another 
to put down everything that's sacred and holy and mock everything that's righteous. And the devil would like nothing better for American people to sit in their living rooms and laugh and mock at everything that's sacred and holy. You know what they're talking about now. They're talking about all kinds of subjects that were once taboo. And now anything goes. Cursing. Uh, I, I was supposed to be in Los Angeles a few weeks ago for the burial of Miss Catherine Coleman on Tuesday. And I couldn't make it. I had the flu. And someone called me. I was at home resting. And someone called me. Said, Mr. Wilson, please turn on Channel 5 right now. Now on Channel 5 at 3.30, there's a program called Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman that plays. And I turned it on. I couldn't believe it. They were mocking Catherine Coleman. There was a healer who was laying hands on somebody in a wheelchair, and the lady fell right out, and they did everything but name Catherine Coleman. And I, I, I wanted to scream because the irony of it is that that very hour they were burying Catherine Coleman. I said, God, the devil won't even let her get in the ground. On the Johnny Carson show, David Fry, the comedian, has learned to mimic Billy Graham. And at the end of his presentation, he got at his hands and knees, looked right in the camera, and said, please send me all your money for my books and records and sermons. I want to be a millionaire. And the crowd went crazy, stomping. And Carson said, that's really funny. You see, if the devil can get us to laugh and to mock a spirit of mirth and frivolity, there was an earthquake the other day. I, I was in that earthquake that hit up there. We were in, in Kentucky last week when that five-state earthquake hit. I was on the 11th floor, and the building began to sway. And, friends, it was a, a terrible experience. And especially that night, I was preaching on the judgment on America and how uh, the massive earthquakes are going to start coming. First, smaller than massive earthquakes. And you know the thing that really bothered me? I, I was going through uh, Memphis where the earthquake had really hit hard. And on the front page of the commercial appeal was a whole section earthquake jokes. They were joking about it. You see, this is the very thing that I'm talking about. David said, the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. Friends, I don't understand how any Christian can even watch a program like Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman. I saw just that episode and a few flashes of two or three others. I said, my God, I can't even look at that. I don't understand some Christian ladies being so addicted to things like as the world turns. I had a, a preacher's wife recently say, Mr. Wolf, I had to quit him for one reason. I found myself applauding, sitting there, urging on in my spirit and applauding divorce and filth. She said, I kept saying, leave him. Run away from him. She said, I found myself applauding and partaking vicariously in those lives. You say, oh boy, now we've got one of those preachers here who's going to preach against coffee next. I'm talking about the hypocrisy of it. And it goes something like this. There'll be a dirty, filthy movie coming on CBS. And the wife's in getting the coffee pot ready. And the husband's in there, and he turns it on, and all of a sudden, there's the promo advertising the film, and there's a filthy scene. And it goes something like, hey, Mabel, quick, quick, quick. You'll never believe what's on television. Hurry, hurry, hurry. And so they sit there and say, my Lord, isn't that awful? What have we, just like Brother Dave said, isn't that awful? And for two hours, they sit there watching the whole thing and say, isn't that awful? What are we coming to? Oh, God, help me. Isn't that awful? Look, isn't that awful? And watch the whole brewing thing. Well, if it bothers you, and if it convicts you, turn it off. Don't be a hypocrite. And I'll tell you something else, friends. I'm not afraid of this baptism of smut. My Bible has a promise for every God-fearing man and woman that's built his house on the rock. If your house is in Christ, and you believe Christ, there's a little knob there. It says off and on, and you're going to have to practice a little discretion from now on because you're being programmed right from hell now. You hear me? It's coming right out of the pits of hell, and you've only seen the beginning. They're going to start taking God's name in vain within the next three months. You're going to hear God's name taken in vain in major uh, prime time. God's name in vain now. Four-letter words. Absolute hell breaking loose in our TV twos. But thank God there's a promise for every Christian. Dad, Mom, you don't have to be afraid if all hell breaks loose. I don't care if all the demons in the hell are unleashed. I don't care if hell does enlarge its borders. My Bible said the man built his house upon the rock, and the floods came, 
the floods of filth and smut and pornography and perversion and could not shake that house because it was on the rock. Thirdly, something the Lord has shown me is that the satisfied sinner is on the verge of committing a sin that is worse than the unpardonable sin. I'm going to preach something you've never heard in your life. I think it's worse than pardonable sin because it's self-inflicted. And it's more tragic than pardonable sin because God is willing to forgive, but man removes himself from God's reach. And it's called a reprobate mind. A reprobate mind. And because they refuse to retain the knowledge of God, therefore God gave them over to a reprobate mind. A reprobate mind. Three places in the Bible. And God gave them over to the wickedness. God gave them up to their uncleanness. God gave them over to a reprobate mind. Do you know what a reprobate mind is? Have you ever met somebody with a reprobate mind? A reprobate mind is a mind that is sold out to a lie. A mind who has been telling itself a lie for so long it begins to accept that lie is the truth. And for this cause, God shall send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie and may be damned to believe not the truth. Given over to a lie. Oh, how many people I have met that have been given over to a lie. I was at a crusade down in Newport News, Virginia, and a 15-year-old lad, about six feet tall, came, a nice-looking kid. He was a drug pusher, and he needed help, so I took him to my ranch in Texas. And I had a, a five-hour counseling session with him one day, and I said, Bruce, why did you come forward crying like that in my meeting? He said, sir, you were talking about a reprobate mind. And he said, Oh, boy, did that hit me. He said, when I was 12 years old, I ran away from home and started selling pot and grass to my friends. And, and for years, I was condemned about it. I thought, I'm ruining the lives of these kids. I'm messing up their minds. He said, but six months ago, the devil planted a little thought in my mind, just a little lie. Bruce, don't condemn yourself anymore. You're not hurting anybody. Don't you know that these kids are being helped through your drugs? Don't you know kids are seeing visions of God? They're getting scared of the devil? Don't you know that they're, they're becoming God conscious through drugs? You are a drug evangelist. You can go out and sell all you want from now on and congratulate yourself. You're doing as much good as any preacher. He said, David, I started going out selling drugs freely. No condemnation. And when I came to your meeting, I was convinced that God had called me, that my whole call in life was to go around selling drugs, opening kids' minds so they could have psychedelic revolutions and see God and angels and demons through drugs. He said, and I was almost convinced that that was my call in life. The reason I was put on this earth was to be a drug evangelist. He said, now that may seem crazy to you, but he said, I was believing that lie. And when you talked about being turned over to a lie, the Holy Spirit rebuked me for that. He said, the fear of God came on me and I ran down the aisle trembling. He said, David, if I hadn't come forward to your meeting, I'd have gone out and sold myself to this lie. I'd have been busted. That had set me up for 30, 40 years, and I'd have been spending 30, 40 years sitting in prison saying, why? I didn't do a bit of harm. I was just helping. And he said, I tremble to think that I almost sold out to that lie. I was believing that lie was the truth. My wife and I counseled a young 19-year-old girl who fell in love with a married doctor in her city. He had three lovely children and a beautiful wife. And this girl said she was losing her mind. She said, I can't eat or sleep. This is tearing me apart. I love this man. I believe that God brought us together, but I don't want to hurt his wife, and I don't want to hurt those three precious little children. He, she said, and I don't know what to do. She said, I love him. She said, I, I love him so much. And we get together, and we pray and read our Bible, and I know that I minister to his spiritual needs. And she said, I, I know God brought us together. I understand him. His wife doesn't understand him, and I do. What am I going to do? And my wife and I sat there for two hours showing her from the scriptures she was living in adultery and fornication, that God would never appease it, that it was of hell, that she was being given over to a lie. And after two years, or two, two hours of preaching to her, when it was all done, we started to realize she hadn't heard a word we said. Because she said, I don't care what you say. Somehow, I believe God brought us together, and he's going to make it possible for us to stay together. What he, she was actually saying, I hope his wife dies so I can get him. That girl's going to wind up in a mental institution. She's given over to a lie. Nobody can reach her. Nobody can touch her. Her mind is shut. I met the worst reprobated minds in my life down in Mexico City. I went down for some crusades in the bullfight arena down in Mexico City a few years ago. And something powerful happened. See, in Mexico City, they have one of the world's biggest prisons. The Lucumberry Prison has over 5,000 inmates. 
And in the inner section, the security section, they have a security section with over 200 murders and rapists. And about eight, nine years ago, a Baptist missionary had distributed hundreds of my books across the Swiss Blade throughout the prison. And of all things, a revival broke out in the section where the murders and rapists were, and 26 got saved. And one of them took a correspondence, the Brian Bible study course, and became a licensed minister. Well, when they found out I was in Mexico City for crusades, they asked me to bring the crusade into the jail. And so I was happy to go. I didn't know all the story. I went through all these security gates, and the guard was saying, hey, man, where are you going? I said, the central security. He said, man, they got murders and rapists in there. I said, I know that's where the revival is. He almost had a coronary. He didn't know what I was talking about. I walked inside that last gate. They slammed it shut. Twenty-six men lined up. The pastor, Brother Delgado, about that tall Mexican in his mid-forties, I imagine, a Bible under his arm, smiled mirror to ear. Praise the Lord, Brother Dave. I got read, I got saved reading your book, The Cross and Switchblade. I'm pastor of the church. Luke and Barry, Berean Church. I want you to meet my associate pastor. These are my deacons. This is my mission secretary. These are my elders. Had a whole thriving church inside that prison. They, they put a table out in the courtyard and asked me to preach. I preached my heart out for half an hour. They gave an invitation. And I was heartbroken. Only five, six men came forward. I went around later. I stayed an hour or two to talk to the, these fellows. I never heard such reprobated foolishness in my life. One said, we don't need a preacher. We need a good lawyer. And every one of those men, they're going to die there. There's no way they're ever going to get out there for life or murder, rape, and all kinds of armed robberies and things. And you know what everyone said? Well, we're going to get out of here. They thought either Castro would invade Cuba or, or would invade Mexico and set them free or because they're in an earthquake zone, the earthquake could knock the walls down or their case would be reviewed and, and they would be released. One man in his 60s, I'm getting out of here and they're going to die there. Yet they're kept together by this lie. They live on a lie. Their minds completely close to any message outside of that little lie given over to it. I was in Florida, just finished the meeting, got in my car to go to the motel and to knock on the window. I rolled it down. An 80-year-old man stuck his head in the window. He said, hi, David, I'm Joe. I said, Joe, am I supposed to know you? He said, yeah, Harkins Market, Braddock, Pennsylvania. Well, when I was a kid, 15 years old, I worked at a Harkins Market in Braddock near Pittsburgh. And there was a man by the name of Joe who lived on the block who used to shop there. And I used to preach at him every time he came in. He said, that's me. I retired and moved to Florida. He said, you know, David, I'm supposed to be dead. I had a terrible heart condition, and they did open heart surgery, took a vein out of my leg and put it in my heart. I've had a new lease on life. I said, Joe, were you in my meeting tonight? He said, yeah, and you preached at me again. I said, oh, you got saved. You came here to tell me. He said, no, sir. I said, Joe, I preached at you when I was 15 years old, years ago. And now I come full circle, and I'm preaching crusades, and I come to your city, and you come to hear me preach. And there was enough conviction there tonight that you could touch it and feel it. And you didn't come forward? No, sir. I said, Joe, you should be dead in hell now, and you know it. Yes, sir. Are you ever, before you die, are you ever going to make Jesus Lord of your life? No, sir. I said, I got a couple old phony friends, and we drink a little and play cards, and he said, i got a philosophy at the end. Everything works out. I'm not like those kids you preach to. He said, I'm no junkie. I didn't hurt anybody. I don't kill nobody. He said, I'm going to make it. Don't worry about me. That man's going to die and go to hell. And he's closed out. He just sit there while I preached amused, just amused. Oh, how this hurts me. I can go up into Harlem, and I can preach to prostitutes and alcoholics, and they run to Christ. And I can go to churches where there are good nicks, I call them goodniks and smuggies. And they sit there smug in their sin. They've sat through 10,000 Jesus songs. They've heard a 1,000 Holy Ghost messages. They've walked out of a 1,000 Holy Ghost invitations. And they've grown hard in their hearts. And they're being given over to a reprobate mind. Now, if you sit here tonight and the Holy Ghost begins to prick your heart and you feel uneasy and you feel a pulling and a tugging, you can thank God that's the Holy Spirit still, still dealing and striving with your heart. But if you sit here tonight saying, well, nothing moves me, I feel absolutely nothing, I would say you're on dangerous ground because the Holy Spirit's here tonight. The Holy Spirit is here to save and the Holy Spirit's here to heal and change your life. Well, I, I believe this with all my heart. The coming of Jesus is right at the door. 
Some people call that the rapture. Now, that term's not in the Bible. Some people call it the capture. That's not in the Bible either, so mine's just as good. I call it the evacuation. He's going to evacuate all the Jesus people in the twinkling of an eye. And friends, I believe that that moment's coming down upon us so fast. I believe it's right at the door. The Bible said right at the door. There's just a thin tissue between time and eternity. And friends, I don't understand how people, with this I'm going to close, I don't understand people who can sit in a meeting like this and stay satisfied with the way they are. And the hardest people in the world to reach are those with, with, that, that are married and settled and, and, and they're at ease. And, and uh, they're good church people and they're good society members. And, and uh, they come to meetings like this and, and they hear me preach and they say, hey, that's all wrong. Or others will be convicted of their sin and my associates will come and say, David, you should have been out in the foyer as people were walking. Some of them were ash and white. Some of them were leaning on their friends and they go out in the cool air and shake off the conviction. I see it. I see it everywhere. And if I had my way, I would go up and down every aisle tonight, one by one, toe to toe, eye to eye with everybody in this building, up in the balcony behind me. And I'd point a finger with love right in your heart and say, are you really ready? Are you ready now? You know in your heart, God's put it in your heart, you know that the end of all things are near. You know that the thing is coming upon us now we've been preaching about for years. And yet people get up and walk out. I don't understand that. I don't understand that. I go home at night and I cry at my motel room and say, oh God, I preached my heart out. There were people there living in their sin, hypocrites, phonies, 95 percenters who've given Jesus 95 percent, but they've been holding back. They've been cheating on God. And friends, one of these days, the Bible said, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess, and every eye shall behold it. You and I are going to stand before God. We answer for the message we hear. And I, I'm on a life and death mission now. I don't care what anybody thinks of my preaching. I've got nothing left to prove. I have absolutely nothing to prove. I've got no ladder to climb. I've got a pulpit always waiting for me on the streets. I'm here to tell you right now, the Holy Spirit has sent me here, and he brought you here tonight to deal with your sin. Be sure your sin will find you out, and God will not let you go out comfortable in your sins like you were when you walked in. God is dealing tonight before his coming with every one of us. I, I was listening to the news recently, and uh, boy, they were talking about Lebanon exploding. They were talking about the danger of war in the Middle East. They were talking about the drought that's spreading in the Midwest. They were talking about this uh, indentation they found in California now. I don't know if you've heard about it from Palm Springs through Palmdale, right above the San Andreas Fault, about 100 miles. There's a strange indentation of the earth now, and scientists say that there's all kinds of activities in the San Andreas Fault. I was listening to all of these reports, and I, I fell asleep in kind of a daze with these things ringing in my mind. And suddenly in the middle of the night, I had a beautiful experience. Uh, I was awakened and the presence of the Lord Jesus had flooded the room. Have you ever had an experience like that where you wake and suddenly the whole room was aglow with the presence of the Savior? Oh, his presence had filled the room. I tried to get up. It was just like a gentle hand pushed me back down. I started to laugh. I was exhilarated. I just, I was, I, I kept saying, Lord, you're in the room. You're here right now. You said you'd never leave us. You'd never forsake us. I sense your presence. I sense your presence. They that come to him must believe that he is, that he's a reward of those who diligently seek him. And Lord, I've been seeking you, and I know you rewarded me right now with a uh, demonstration of your presence. You're in this room. And suddenly, I began to realize that all I've been preaching about the coming of the Lord is about to happen. This is the generation that shall not pass. All these things come to fulfillment. My granddad preached it. My dad preached it. Now I'm the fourth generation of preachers in my family preaching the coming of the Lord, but friends, I am living, and the Lord made it so real, I am living in the generation that will not pass till it's all fulfilled. And suddenly, a revelation of God gets my heart. It's coming. We're nearing the hour. We're nearing the time. And suddenly, the nearness of the coming of the Lord, not only the Father knows that day, but oh, I, I believe the Holy Spirit was prompted my heart to this. All the signs pointed to it. And suddenly, I, I thought of all the terrible things happening in the world and the chaos. I jumped up right in the bed. My wife must have thought I was having a fit. And I yelled at the top of my voice, I'm so glad I'm saved. Where will the people go now for comfort? Where do they go? I know what happens to me. 
When you hear an evil report, what do you do? You go to the secret closet. You turn it over to your faith. And you deal with it by the word. But where does a person go now? I put out a movie called Road to Armageddon. And I told friends to go out and bite their neighbors. One lady went and knocked on her neighbor's door and said, Would you come to uh, the church tonight and see a movie about Armageddon? She said, My goodness, no. She said, I'm so scared I'm not watching the news. Why in the world would I go see a movie about the end of the world? You see, the whole world sitting in fear. Oh, thank God. I'm saved.